Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Major funding for the Woodwright Shop is provided by... More than 40 million people who care for their cars and homes choose State Farm for their insurance. State Farm, a proud supporter of the Woodwright's shop. Hi, welcome back to the Woodwright Shop. I'm Roy Underhill. So glad you can be with me again today because we are honored to be in the workshop studio of a craftsman designer who is informed by the tradition of Japanese woodworking but not bound by convention. We're just a stone's throw from Walden Pond up in Massachusetts here in the workshop of John Reed Fox. John, thank you for having Hi, us up here. Boy, oh boy. What were you working on right there? I'm planning a board to finish here. Oh my gosh. It's a cherry, cherry board. Gosh, look at that. That's like one cell thick, those shavings. That's incredible. But yeah. it's not about the shavings. <laughs> it's not about the shavings, Roy. It's, it's about the finish that it puts on the board. Uh, plain finish is uh, ultra smooth, clear, bright finish. And it's done with the Japanese plane pulled towards you. Pulled towards you, yes. Well, I know we don't have much time, but you're going to show us a little introduction to the Japanese Hopefully. woodworking tools. So much to learn. The life's so short. But I tell you, why don't we begin by looking at some of your work, some okay. of your uh, work indeed inspired by the Japanese tradition. This is uh, shoji inspired? It's, it's a shoji inspired um, trifold screen. Um, uh, it's wonderful, this grill work, and this is called? Uh, it's, all of the grills are kumiko, and this is just a special type of uh, kumiko grill work. It's constructed. Kumiko, um, not, okay, and, and, but you mean by constructed, this is built up of long sticks, right? long pieces of wood that are joined together with joints at each of these intersections. That's correct, yeah, a lot of joinery. <laughs> so there's not saw it out. And uh, what kind of wood is this? Uh, it's Alaskan yellow cedar. It's old growth Alaskan yellow. My uh, with gosh. In, incredibly picked for a very, very tight straight grain. Well, this is a splendid use of a very rare wood. I mean, it's really wonderful. Uh, and here we see it, too, in, in a piece that you have done, John. This is uh, a, a cabinet. A cabinet. I see it as an entryway piece. Uh, oh. It was done on spec. Oh, it's wonderful. And you've done that to, again, Kumiko work up here on the door. And I see beneath uh, that, uh, this is cherry again? It's a uh, book-matched, um, resawn book-matched cherry, uh, quarter-sawn cherry panels. Wonderful. And, but, you know, in the Western tradition, this would be the most flamboyant piece you could do with flame coming out and everything and crazy stuff. Right. I try to keep my work um, very subtle. I'm looking for a sort of restrained, subtle elegance. Ah, the quiet, quiet. And, and the same is true on the finish, too. There's a wonderful, you can see the truth of the wood through this finish. Yeah, that's what a plain finish gives you. And this is all, so this is all hand, all of the surfaces in my work are hand planed. Plane. All right, plane so we're going to achieve this truth in the wood. We've got to see how we get truth in the plane. Okay. So maybe we need to move to the technique. Let's start with looking at the element. First of all, let's look at, look at the technique once again and how you use the, the plane. Uh, the plane is pulled um, instead of being pushed. Um, this is set for a very, very fine cut right now. Gosh. And it, you can see that it gives you a... <laughs> That's tremendous. It's like one cell thick. That yeah, is astounding. it's very thin. Oh, all right. Well, now, when you talk about the planes, you say, I've heard you say, the blacksmith who made this plane. Now, that's something in the Western tradition we would not say the blacksmith. We'd say the plane maker and focus on the wood. But here it's about the iron. It's, it's all about the iron. All that a plane is really is a plain iron, um, which is the heart of it, and a jig to carry that through the wood or across the wood. Could we take a look at it up close there? Sure. Here, there's not me... even a wedge in this. Do you want to uh, use a different one Let's here? Let's take this one apart. Um, Oh, that's what this is. Uh, looks like you've put a lot of use on this guy. Right. You can always tell uh, someone's best, uh, their best tool or their favorite tool because it's all worn out. <laughs> and that's, that's how it should be. They have a life, a working life of their own. You tap on the back and... Uh, and it just, it just pops out because it's a wedge. It just pops. Ah. And that's how and, it's adjusted. And I can see on that face there, this is hollow there. That's been hollowed on the back face. 
Is it two layers? It's, it's, it's laminated steel, so if you turn it over on the bevel side, um, you can see this very bright area yeah. on, on the bottom. That's um, an iron with, uh, with carbon, it's a, so it's a high, high carbon steel, uh -huh. and it's, it can be made by the, each individual blacksmith can, can forge that to have certain properties. And that's that bright layer down there, right close to the edge, so like a layer sixteenth of an inch thick on the flat side. And right. what is it? What's the and material? And that's, that's then the blacksmith forge welds that to a backing material. And in this case, it's wrought iron, which mm. is just a, a, a no carbon <laughs> iron. So it's very tough. So you're combining the toughness of the iron with that hard, hard carbon steel there. Yeah, that's correct. And it, it also gives mass, mm -hmm. um, and it, it makes it a, a very, you can see these blades are much, much they heavier are. and more massive than a Western iron. So they're their own wedge. But why the hollow? I don't understand well, why the hollow is this, in there. This steel, for, uh, the cutting steel, is so hard that if this wasn't hollowed out, you wouldn't really be able to flatten the back. So you wouldn't be able to sharpen the tool. Ah, I see. And so it's just the, the hollow is scraped in uh, after it's forged and it's just a sharpening aid. Now, sharpening, this has got to be incredibly sharp to be able to cut that's, so fine. That's right, Roy. Yeah. Could you show just a little bit about that? And I know, uh, in, as in Western sharpening, you're just going from one abrasive to from coarse to finer to finer. But could we go to the final yeah, that's, stone? That's there? correct. I mean, the, the final stone, I mean, that's correct. I, I use a series of, actually, I'm now using ceramic stones to. Mm -hmm. Um, make create the geometry that is the sharpness, which is one flat plane intersecting another flat plane. So, um, so they really just have to come down to that last point. It's exactly. Two straight lines converging, and that's the cutting. Converging, edge. and ideally, it's infinitely small you know, <laughs> and very smooth. But to, to create an, an edge here that's really, really smooth, so that you don't get um, marks from that jaggedness in your finish, uh -huh. um, you need to go to progressively finer stones. And my final stone is um, this uh, Honyama stone. From, it's from a one quarry in Kyoto. And, and it's, um, oh. it's a water stone, so it's used wet. Uh -huh. um, and I just will, at the very, very end, I'll be Gosh. just lightly, very lightly working on this stone. This is probably an equivalent to around a 30,000 grit stone. And it, the stone is called a what stone? Honyama. Honyama. And I imagine this is uh, quite a valuable stone here. It, it's a quite valuable stone. The natural stones, uh, I, I don't, when I teach, I don't suggest them for really? uh, beginners or intermediates. No, they're very expensive and they require touch and um, also a lot of knowledge. You have to know what kind of a stone you want, hard or uh -huh. soft. And um, you can see how it's building a little paste. I see it. it. Yeah, there's a little darkness coming. This that's, steel that's particle the, in the stone. That's the steel particulate. Even with a stone this fine, it's cutting really nicely. Wow, what a special! And it's. You're, I see how you're very carefully working over it with those short strokes, right, working, but the all whole over surface. the stone and trying to keep the stone flat uh, because again, it's one. You can see it almost sticks. It's so flat it almost sticks good heavens, to the, the to vacuum. The, yeah. Wow. Now, John, I, you know, what I would do is I'll get out to a burr, I'm sorry, just a bad sharpening habit, so I will let a, a wire edge come out, and then I'll say, okay, I'm going to just kind of stroke that off, but that's the wrong thing to do, you say. Right. Um, what, what I do on, on these tools is we just sharpen off the burr. If you fold that burr back and forth, it's a form of work hardening, and it, it, when it rips off, when it does finally break, actually, it creates a very jagged finish. And also, you've changed the uh, working properties of that steel on the end, so uh -huh. it's not going to be what you really want. So ideally, you're just sharpening that off. You're cutting on mm -hmm. one face and then cutting on the other, and you get that real smooth final mm -hmm. finish. So if you want to do this kind of work, even with Western plates, you better learn something from Japanese sharpening techniques. Yes, you need, you need to be able to <laughs> sharp. I mean, you can see that the shavings are on the order of 5 microns thick. That's then just down Yes. Then you're, there have, the, what that does tell us is that there's no defect in the iron mm -hmm. that's that great. So, <laughs> All right, I yeah. understand. Okay. Well, now this goes into the, uh, what is this called? The dye here, you say? The body? Right. Of the the body is, in, in Japanese, it's called the dye. And, and this and is oak here, it looks like. It's Japanese. Uh, this particular one is Japanese red oak. Most of my uh, newer ones, this is a very old plane, are Japanese white oak. Um, they're made uh, either on the rift sawn or flat sawn, and I you can see, see the ray pattern. Yeah. The ray pattern. So here's the bark of the, the tree. The bark is out. It'll be out there, and it doesn't have a wedge. It just goes right in. There, each one is. Uh, you'll take your iron and hand fit it to the each die, each body. Each body. And the, uh -huh. I, the iron is wedge shaped mm -hmm. in this direction, to so match. that, yeah. um, and you will just create a wedge shaped bed. 
that mm -hmm. fits it exactly. And the iron is also hollow a little bit on this side so oh. that it keys in. So e they look very simple. Uh, they are simple, but they look very simple, but they're actually quite sophisticated. Lot, that's there's the way it's all the way through. On. A lot of stuff going on there's here. Going, very subtle, and there's a lot going on. And, and different planes will have different bedding angles, mm -hmm. depending on what type of wood you're working. And different irons will be made with uh, specific working qualities for different woods in yes. mind. So they're very, very subtle tools that are quite specific. And so here, this is basically the jig here. And you, you've got this one adjusted. Uh, to cut, but I noticed when you, when you turned it over, it's polished, and this is the direction of travel. It's polished right here and here. This seems to have been scraped away. Yeah, that's right. It, the Japanese plane only hits um, the, the wood, the surface, right in front of the blade and right at the very front end of the plane. So it's hollow in here, and, and then and this is given clearance Most well. importantly, completely co given clearance in back of the blade. That doesn't touch. And now the hollow here just makes it very easy to make it hit um, in a coplanar manner on two surfaces. So that's just very easy. And there's less friction, too. Ah, that, well, that's, that's helpful. Now, how do you make sure that these things are lined okay, up? Okay, you haven't take, got it twisted. Right, you'll take your winding sticks, which traditional tool in any woodworking tradition. Yes, uh, we all have uh, errors all have to wind, amplify. Wind, yeah, exactly, and it, what the winding sticks do, of course, is they amplify your error, and you'll sight across them to make sure that the sticks line up exactly. And by just scraping gently with a chisel, you can adjust this surface to be flat, uh -huh. like you can check for flatness, and also that these two are exact, are not in winding. Are yeah, they're just a there. straight, flat plane. There. Exactly. Oh, right. And then you would... Um, Put a stick across. Oh, and sight and look for the... And, and sight and make sure you have your hollows. A, ah. a hollow here and relief in back. Right. Let me see if I maybe just one more pass with the plane before we move on because I want to see some of the other Japanese planes as well that you have here. And uh, um, no, uh, this plane is called, this one have a specific name? Um, uh, for just a yes, bench plane? Um, uh, you, yeah, I mean this is just, it's just a finishing plane. Mm -hmm. um, because you have the other ones here that come in. I know the Japanese planes, again, a pole plane, but here is one we'd recognize. This is for doing what, uh, um, sliding yeah, this, dovetails? Exactly. This is a plane for making sliding dovetails, and you can see how it's got um, spurs uh -huh. to create the shoulder. Yeah. And this will actually, if you take it apart, will make the um, groove also. Oh, all right. And so there's that little... Uh, very subtle. And again, it's a very gentle uh, sliding dovetail right That's correct, there. Yeah. Cut with this plane, so again, pulling, pulling this down. way. Always pull and, um, with these planes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I use this actually quite a bit in my work because since I work with solid wood, I'm using uh, tapered sliding dovetails quite a bit. Ah, to join the, and, and, and the joiner. joiner. A great joint. And this is great. This looks like a uh, spoke shave here? Correct, yeah. And a spoke shave is obviously, it's just a small plane, a tiny plane. Um, this, this one has a curved bottom, but I have them with flat bottoms and with different radiuses in the bottom. And this is how you would do a flare, say, for a leg? For example, or on the like legs that. of the, the, the little cabinet. I see. And then this one here, it looks like it comes with a, a lot of stuff happening here. Uh, there's a track for it and uh, skates on it and all kinds of things happening This is here. A, a very special plane that's really no longer um, being made um, and uh, the person who makes the bodies for all of my planes made this for me as a gift. Uh, it's a special plane that's um, made so that you can very precisely thickness the, um, the tiny little bars ah. that are, I use for that very, very fine um, grid work. So this is set for the thickness uh, plus this. Why do you have this separate track that it runs on? Why do you do well, that? Well, these need to be so precisely thickness, precisely exactly the same, uh -huh. that um, my bench is not really flat. Even <laughs> no when kidding. I flatten my bench, it's not flat enough, so I had to make a special track. It's, uh, this is quartered uh, ah. vertical grain cherry, and, so and that, it stays very, very stable. That keeps it stable. So you're pulling this along, and there seems to be like a roller here. What is this? Right, Roy. The coolest thing about it is that um, because these are narrow, they'll tend to want to flap a little bit. And um, Oh, heavens. And Look it's a spring-loaded, turned bamboo pressure bar. Ahead of the blade. Just so ahead of the blade. This is holding it down just before the blade comes exactly. in contact with it. Exactly. Gosh, what a wonderful community, too, of people. I love this. You always say, this is, you know who made this plane. Yes, yes. I know who and made the plane. You made it as I, a I gift for the you yeah. and in honor of, of the work that you do. Well, so there you go. There's the, the sticks now. So I guess we're moving, moving on to the sticks 
Uh, but to do this kind of work here, uh, you make the pieces with the plane, but it's, of course, the Japanese saws that cut this out. Can we take a right. moment and look at sure, those? Sure, sure. Uh, what have you got here? Ah. Well, here we have um, two different types of saw. This is a, a Ryoba ah. style. It's got um, rip teeth on one, one end, edge and cross-cut teeth on the other edge, and the saw is scraped hollow in the middle, and the set on the teeth on both sides is exactly the same, so that you could cut, this could cut as deep as you needed to in either direction, and you would bypass the teeth uh, on the other side without the teeth marking your material. And unlike uh, Western saws that cut on the pole stroke, of course, again, like the planes, it cuts on the pole so the steel can be so thin. It's so thin and you can see, like, remarkably flexible. <laughs> but th that's exact. The, the Zen explanation that's given is that if you push a blade of grass between your fingers, of course, it buckles. Yes. But if you pull it, it becomes straight by itself. Ah, so this will cut straight. So it cut, they cut really straight and they don't run into that having to beef up the saw blade as in western plane, uh, saws where you, mm -hmm. you have to worry about the it's saw a buckling. Thick, lot thicker. But now here you have one with a back on it. Tell me about this saw. Right. This is called a, a dozuki and um, it's got, it can be, come with uh, cross cut or rip teeth. This has rip teeth on it. Oh. And again, the saws are very subtle and very specific. Um, the size of the teeth relates and number per inch relate to the size of work you'll be doing. and. Um, whether the size, the size and style of teeth might be related to the type of wood you're working, a hardwood or a softwood, and the... Um, oh, what would you use this one for now? This is, and I use, I, this is my dovetail, dovetail saw for when I'm, I'm making drawers. Can we do um, a little bit of that? Have you sure, got some... you can uh, see how remarkably fine um, they cut very straight. It sort of takes all the magic out of <laughs> dovetailing if you've got a, oh, nice, really? a nice saw. It's, it's just too easy. But again, rip teeth because we're going down the grain. Right, and, and you and they just... they hook a little more than... Yes, Western. and, and you, I, I apply virtually no pressure. Ah. Uh, the, the saw cuts rapidly and straight and beautifully. Ah. Um, well, of course, because the hook tends to feed itself. It's a hungrier saw than what we're used to. And in we're not trying Europe for the work. perfect dovetail here, but I would right. stop at my scribe lines and I like to... My friends make fun of me when I do this, but I like to. Oh, you, you set you set your cut at an angle, so I, it's vertical. Set I, the board I at an cut angle. my set my cut the board vertical uh, at an angle and and cut straight down. Yeah. Uh, most of my friends think this shows that I, my hand skills are just not <laughs> not where they should be. <laughs> well, it's astounding. Even if people are not uh, using Japanese planes, certainly Japanese saws have made inroads into American practice here. And and these are very these are also very fine, handmade saws. Mm. Um, actually, the Ryoba is is, is um, a little bit of a production saw, but this is a very very fine handmade saw. You can see in them the. Uh, the tensioning marks on the blade, the That's little where dots it's been struck where they've, with a hammer where they've been to struck to tension it to get the make it so it will lie straight. Uh, and on each tooth, you can see the tiny little strike I marks see it. from these uh, the person who sharpened it setting the the teeth. And so you can see it's on every other one it's and on the other side. Oh my little, gosh! Tap tap tap. Tap tap. And uh, you can really see how remarkably fine those lines are. There's that hardly is, anything there's hardly there. Any line there. Well, speaking of which, now, now you're ready for a chisel uh, to take that out? Uh, yeah, to... and so if I were making dovetails in a drawer, mm -hmm. I would... Uh... Oh, look, I see. The chisels are the same thing here. I just pick this up to look at it. Sure. And I see on the broad one and, and, and the narrow one, again, they're hollowed. Is that for the same reason? Right, that's for the same reason. Um, they're both. They're also laminated steel. On the, you can see on the beveled side, uh -huh. um, and that steel is so hard that were this to be one large area, it would just <laughs> take you forever. It probably would not be possible to, to sharpen it. So the so hollowing it's a, is a it's sharpening, just a sharpening aid. aid, and this one has multiple hollows. It's it's kind of a style. Some people feel that if you're, um, if I can hold it for you. yes, if you're um, up against an edge. Having uh, the multiple support um, is easier so that you don't sort of fall into the hollow. I see. Um, ah, I, that makes sense, indeed. So you're tracking along, so it's dead flat on exactly, the lands you've got, between you've got, hollows. Exactly, your lands all the way across. All right, well, let me let you go ahead and 
dovetail. I'm sorry, I'm reluctant to give up these chisels once they get into my hands. <laughs> yeah, and so if it was me, I would just obviously, this is no different than how you would do your western dovetail, and I would gently set my line. Okay, so now you've got to turn it around and work in by hand. So there's your start. And then I would come in a little bit. The uh, chisels are on the edges. You can see that this is a bench chisel, but ah. they're not vertical. Um, even the, the tiny little bottom part uh, where, where it's uh, hard steel is in at a slight angle. And this really helps you doing work like dovetail work because you can get right up to the edge without damaging I see. The, uh, the edge of your work. Ah. So they're, they're, again, they're also, they're very, very thoughtful There's tools. subtleties all the way through this that you don't see, and people just need to take the time to look and learn. And, of course, that's uh, part of your work, John. I know you teach around the country, uh, Japanese I do. And, and woodworking, but and design, too. Yeah, I teach both um, sort of more uh, technique-oriented classes in um, Japanese woodworking tools, but uh, I also teach classes in... Um, <laughs> In, in design, in, in, because really, in the in the end, Roy, the 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 work needs to stand on its own. It's not a collection of um, a bundle of technique. Ah. Uh, it has to have its own voice and you know be poetry on its own. So yeah. it, the aesthetic, really, the aesthetic considerations and how you choose wood, how you look at form, um, in order to make the statement that you want to make, whatever statement that is, is really the primary um, the. the primary goal when I'm teaching is, is to work on those those things. I see. Well, I'm going to have to ask you more about technique because I know everybody wants to see about about this here. We will have to come back to the designs and the truth of the wood uh, a little later here. But we've got some, uh, we've just got to see how this goes together. And okay. I wonder if you could go ahead and piece uh, some okay. of these the, business. These are made of, uh, if I can, the, the big one. This is mm -hmm. one hexagon. Okay. Um, this is a, a, a teaching tool. It's uh -huh. a little bit sloppy of um, and this is how it goes together in many sections. So you have um, at each intersection of the hexagon and in the center, you've got a triple lap joint. Ah, so you and have they, to cut away two-thirds of each piece. Two-thirds of each piece get cut away. And now when I do them in, in real life, they're, they're much finer. They're almost, they're only two-thirds the thickness of, of these. Ah. But um, so you have a bottom piece right, that's hold that. grooved. Um, over and over again uh, in a small little fixture with a saw, with mm -hmm. one of my hand saws. And then the next piece and then goes the on the next that. piece, which is um, obviously needs a, a groove for the top and the bottom. All right, so it has the third in the middle remains and lines up so that it forms a path and for so, the top third. Yeah, and hopefully all your, hopefully all your shoulders yeah. line up. And then the third one is similar to the bottom. It's cut away two-thirds but it needs a shoulder because it only goes, half of it only goes a third of the way. Oh, I see. All right. So it's, it's two thirds in, in I'm, not, I'm not going to touch it because this seems so fragile right and, now. And they are fragile and they also fit by, only by pressure. There's no glue. So they need to ah. dent the wood a tiny little bit. So they really only go together one time. Oh my gosh. Okay, well don't do it then if we're going to have to take it and, apart. Um, but what's astounding is even though it's so fragile when you do that, when you put it together, this is very strong. I'm really right. Once you get the, the grid assembled, and, and this is true of the regular Kumiko pattern in, mm. in Shoji, the, the whole door becomes extremely rigid ah. because it, um, you've got multiple uh, lapping joints. So it's just kind of like building a torsion box. I see. Well, John, this has some infill, too, inside each triangle now. Yeah, that's right. I have different patterns that I can use to fill in the triangles, and then I can fill in, <laughs> choose to fill in different <laughs> triangles or not fill them in and create different patterns in the screen, different decorative patterns in the screen. But you go nuts. I mean, you've got to, for each triangle, you've got to put in three more pieces. It gets pretty insane, uh, <laughs> although in this, it's only two pieces. Um, this top piece is a single piece that's mitered on both ends, saw curved in the middle, and then hinged open. This and one right here. That yeah. one. And then this third little piece acts by being a little bit tight as a wedge fit uh, uh, pressure. Yeah, we're going to we're going to see how you do that. You have, like you say, the the plane itself is just a jig, so you just use another jig. Exactly, right. exactly. It's pretty simple. It's just a donkey's ear. Um, mm -hmm. And there's and your piece. There's, there's your long my piece. Little, my little long piece, and right. I'm, this is going to hold the plane at an angle. So uh -huh. I'll create my my miters this way, uh -huh. and then I flip the piece over and do it again. Uh -huh. 
So and you got the would, ends I would, done. I would turn it around, and um, then I take a special saw that has a no set, so it's very fine blade. Oh my gosh. And I kerf it almost all the way through, but uh -huh. not quite. <laughs> um, I put a little bit of water on the back. Ah, and that allows you to be, make it flexible. To open it up, so that, that's what you're up. talking about with the hinge, yeah. And then that goes in. That goes in, and, and by pressure, keys the, the whole thing together. I got you. All right. Well, speaking of key, John Reed Fox, you've given us the key to open the door to Japanese woodcraft. Thanks so much. Thank you. My pleasure, Roy. All right, and thank you for joining me here in the Woodwright Shop. This is Roy Underhill. So long. To learn more about the Woodwright Shop and traditional woodworking, visit PBS online. You can find us at pbs.org. Major funding for the Woodwright Shop is provided by Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. We are PBS. Roy Underhill is the author of The Woodwright Shop and other books about traditional woodworking, published by the University of North Carolina Press and available at bookstores and libraries. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Major funding for the Woodwright Shop is provided by... More than 40 million people who care for their cars and homes choose State Farm for their insurance. State Farm a proud supporter of the Woodwright's shop. Hi, welcome back to the Woodwright Shop. I'm Roy Underhill. So glad you can be with me again today because we are honored to be in the workshop studio of a craftsman designer who is informed by the tradition of Japanese woodworking but not bound by convention. We're just a stone's throw from Walden Pond up in Massachusetts here in the workshop of John Reed Fox. John, thank you for having Hi, us up here. Boy, oh boy. What were you working on right there? I'm planning a board to finish here. Oh my gosh. It's a cherry, cherry board. Gosh, look at that. That's like one cell thick, those shavings. That's incredible. But yeah. it's not about the shavings. <laughs> it's not about the shavings, Roy. It's, it's about the finish that it puts on the board. Uh, plain finish is uh, ultra smooth, clear, bright finish. And it's done with the Japanese plane pulled towards you. Pulled towards you, yes. Well, I know we don't have much time, but you're going to show us a little introduction to the Japanese Hopefully. woodworking tools. So much to learn. The life's so short. But I tell you, why don't we begin by looking at some of your work, some okay. of your uh, work indeed inspired by the Japanese tradition. This is uh, shoji inspired? It's, it's a shoji inspired um, trifold screen. Um, uh, it's wonderful, this grill work, and this is called? On the order of five microns thick. That's then, astounding, yes. Then you're, there have, the, what that does tell us is that there's no defect in the iron mm -hmm. that's that great. So. <laughs> All right, I understand, yeah. okay. Well now this goes into 
the, uh, what is this called, the dye here, you say, the body? Right, of the, the body is, in, in Japanese, it's called the dye. And, and this is oak here, it looks like. It's Japanese. Uh, this particular one is Japanese red oak. Most of my uh, newer ones, this is a very old plane, are Japanese white oak. Um, they're made uh, either on the rift sawn or flat sawn. And I you see can see the ray pattern. Yeah. The ray pattern. So here's the bark of the, the tree. The bark is out. It'll be out there. And it doesn't have a wedge, it just goes right in? There, each one is, uh, you, you'll take your iron and hand fit it to the each die, each body. Each body. And the, right. the iron is wedge shaped mm -hmm. in this direction to so match. that, yeah. um, and you will just create a wedge shaped bed mm -hmm. that fits it exactly. And the iron is also hollow a little bit on this side so oh. that it keys in. So e they look very simple. Uh, they are simple, but they look very simple, but they're actually quite sophisticated. A lot, that's the there's way it's all the way through. On. A lot of stuff going on there's here. A lot going, very subtle, and there's a lot going on. And, and different planes will have different bedding angles, mm -hmm. depending on what type of wood you're working. And different irons will be made with uh, specific working qualities for different woods in yes. mind. So they're very, very subtle tools that are quite specific. And so here, this is basically the jig here. And you've, you've got this one adjusted. Uh, to cut, but I noticed when you, when you turned it over, it's polished, and this is the direction of travel. It's polished right here and here. This seems to have been scraped away. Yeah, that's right. It, the Japanese plane only hits um, the, the wood, the surface, right in front of the blade and right at the very front end of the plane. So it's hollow in here, and, and, then, and this is given clearance as well. Most importantly, completely co given clearance in back of the blade. That doesn't touch. And now the hollow here just makes it very easy to make it hit um, in a coplanar manner on two surfaces. Converging, and that's the cutting Converging, edge. and ideally it's infinitely small and, <laughs> and very smooth. But to, to create an, an edge here that's really, really smooth so that you don't get um, marks from that jaggedness in your finish, uh -huh. Um, you need to go to progressively finer stones. And my final stone is um, this uh, Honyama stone. For, it's from a one quarry in Kyoto. And, and it's, um, oh. it's a water stone, so it's used wet. Uh -huh. um, and I just will, at the very, very end, I'll be Gosh. just lightly, very lightly working on this stone. This is probably an equivalent to around a 30,000 grit stone. And it, the stone is called a what stone? Honyama. Honyama, and I imagine this is uh, quite a valuable stone here. It, it's a quite valuable stone. The natural stones, uh, I, I don't, when I teach, I don't suggest them for really? uh, beginners or intermediates. No, they're very expensive, and they require touch, and um, also a lot of knowledge. You have to know what kind of a stone you want, hard or uh -huh. soft, and um, you can see how it's building a little paste. I see it, the, yeah. There's a little darkness coming, this that's, steel that's particle the, in the stone. That's the steel particulate. Even with a stone this fine, it's cutting really nicely. Wow. What a special... And it's, you're, I see how you're very carefully working over it with those short strokes, right, working but the all whole over surface. The stone and trying to keep the stone flat uh, because, again, it's one... You can see it almost sticks. It's so flat, it almost sticks good heavens, to the... Good the vacuum. The, yeah. Wow. Now, John, I, you know, I would do is I'll get out to a burr, I'm sorry, just a bad sharpening habit, so I will let a, a wire edge come out, and then I'll say, okay, I'm going to just kind of stroke that off, but that's the wrong thing to do, you say. Right. Um, what, what I do on, on these tools is we just sharpen off the burr. If you fold that burr back and forth, it's a form of work hardening, and it, it, when it rips off, when it does finally break, actually, it creates a very jagged finish. And also, you've changed the uh, working properties of that steel on the end, so uh. it's not going to be what you really want. So ideally, you're just sharpening that off. You're cutting on one face and then cutting on the other, and you get that real smooth final mm -hmm. finish. So if you want to do this kind of work, even with Western plates, you better learn something from Japanese sharpening techniques. Yes, you need, you need to be able to <laughs> sharp. I mean, you can see that the shavings are... Uh, it's, all of the grills are kumiko, and this is just a special type of uh, kumiko grill work. It's constructed. Kumiko, um, not, okay, and and but you mean about constructed? This is built up of long sticks, right? Long pieces of wood that are joined together with joints at each of these intersections. That's correct. Yeah, a lot of joinery. No, <laughs> so there's not saw it out. And uh, what kind of wood is this? Uh, it's Alaskan yellow cedar. It's old growth Alaskan yellow, oh uh, with an incredibly picked for a very very tight straight grain. Well, this is a splendid use of a very rare wood. I mean, it's really wonderful. Uh, and here we see it, too, in, in a piece that you have done, John. This is uh, a, a cabinet. A cabinet. I see it as an entryway piece. Uh, oh. It was done on spec. Oh, it's wonderful. Mm. You've done that, again, Kumiko work up here on the door. And I see beneath uh, that 
Uh, this is cherry again? It's a uh, book matched, um, resawn book matched cherry, uh, quarter sawn cherry panels. Wonderful. And, but you know, in the Western tradition, this would be the most flamboyant piece you could do with flame coming out and everything and crazy stuff. Right. I try to keep my work um, very subtle. I'm looking for a sort of restrained, subtle elegance. Ah, the quiet, quiet. And, and the same is true on the finish, too. There's a wonderful, you can see the truth of the wood through this finish. Yeah, that's what a plain finish gives you. And this is all, so this is all hand, all of the surfaces in my work are hand planed. Plain. All right, plain so we're going to achieve this truth in the wood. We've got to see how we get truth in the plane. Okay. So maybe we need to move to the technique. Let's start with looking at the element. First of all, let's look at, look at the technique once again and how you use the the plane. Uh, the plane is pulled um, instead of being pushed. Um, this is set for a very, very fine cut right now. Gosh. And it, you can see that it gives you a... <laughs> That's tremendous. It's like one cell thick. That yeah, is astounding. It's very thin. Oh, all right. Well, now, when you talk about the planes, you say... I've heard you say the blacksmith who made this plane. Now that's something in the Western tradition we would not say the blacksmith. We'd say the plane maker and focus on the wood. But here it's about the iron. It's, it's all about the iron. All that a plane is really is a plain iron, um, which is the heart of it, and a jig to carry that through the wood or across the wood. Could we take a look at it up close? Here? Sure. Here, there's not me... even a wedge in this. Do you want to uh, use a different one Let's here? Let's take this one apart. Um, Oh, that's what this is. Uh, looks like you've put a lot of use on this guy. Right. You can always tell uh, someone's best, uh, their best tool or their favorite tool because it's all worn out. <laughs> and that's that's how it should be. They have a life, a working life of their own. You tap on the back and uh, and it just it just pops out because it's a wedge. It just pops. Ah. And that's how and, it's adjusted. And I can see on that face there. This is hollow there. That's been hollowed on the back face. Is it two layers? It's it's, it's laminated steel. So if you turn it over on the bevel side um, you can see this very bright area yeah. on, on the bottom that's um, an iron with uh, with carbon it's a so it's a high high carbon steel uh -huh. and it's, it can be made by the, each individual blacksmith can can forge that to have certain properties and that's that bright layer down there right close to the edge so like a layer 16th of an inch thick on the flat side and right. what is it what's the and material that's, that's then the blacksmith forge welds that to a backing material and in this case it's wrought iron which mm. is just a, a, a no carbon <laughs> iron. So it's very tough so you're combining the toughness of the iron with that hard hard carbon steel there. Yeah that's correct and it, it also gives mass mm -hmm. um, and it, it makes it a, a very you can see these blades are much much they heavier are. and more massive than a western iron. So they're their own wedge but why the hollow? I don't understand well, why the hollow is this, in there. This steel, for, uh, the cutting steel is so hard that if this wasn't hollowed out you wouldn't really be able to flatten the back so you wouldn't be able to sharpen the tool. Ah, I see. And so it's just the, the hollow is scraped in uh, after it's forged and it's just a sharpening aid. Now, sharpening, this has got to be incredibly sharp to be able to cut so that's, fine. That's right, Roy. Yeah. Could you show just a little bit about that? And I know, uh, in, as in Western sharpening, you're just going from one abrasive to from coarse to finer to finer. But could we go to the final yeah, that's, stone? That's there? correct. I mean, the, the final stone, I mean, that's correct. I, I use a series of, actually, I'm now using ceramic stones to. Um, make create the geometry that is the sharpness, which is one flat plane intersecting another flat plane. So, um, so they really just have to come down to that last point. Exactly. Two straight lines. Podcasts on unctv.org are made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNCTV. Major funding for the Woodwright Shop is provided by. More than 40 million people who care for their cars and homes choose State Farm for their insurance. State Farm, a proud supporter of the Woodwrights Shop.
Hi, welcome back to the Woodwright Shop. I'm Roy Underhill. So glad you can be with me again today because we are honored to be in the workshop studio of a craftsman designer who is informed by the tradition of Japanese woodworking but not bound by convention. We're just a stone's throw from Walden mm -hmm. Pond up in Massachusetts here in the workshop of John Reed Fox. John, thank you for having Hi, us up here. Boy, oh boy. What were you working on right there? I'm planning a board to finish here. Oh my gosh. It's a cherry, cherry board. Gosh, look at that. That's like one cell thick, those shavings. That's incredible. But it's yeah. not about the shavings. It's not about the <laughs> shavings, Roy. It's, it's about the finish that it puts on the board. Uh, plain finish is a uh, ultra smooth, clear, bright finish. And it's done with the Japanese plane pulled towards you. Pulled towards you, yes. Well, I know we don't have much time, but you're going to show us a little introduction to the Japanese Hopefully. woodworking <laughs> tools. So much to learn. The life's so short. But I tell you, why don't we begin by looking at some of your work, some okay. of your uh, work indeed inspired by the Japanese tradition. This is a uh, shoji inspired? It's, it's a shoji inspired um, trifold screen. Um, uh, it's wonderful. This grill work and this is called? Uh, it's, all of the grills are kumiko and this is just a special type of uh, kumiko grill work. It's constructed. Kumiko, um, not, okay. And, and, but you mean by constructed? This is built up of long sticks. Right. Long pieces of wood that are joined together with joints at each of these intersections. That's correct. Yeah, a lot of joinery. No. <laughs> so there's not saw it out. And uh, what kind of wood is this? Uh, it's Alaskan yellow cedar. It's old growth Alaskan yellow. My uh, gosh. Incredibly picked for a very, very tight straight grain. Well, this is a splendid use of a very rare wood. I mean, it's really wonderful. Uh, and here we see it, too, in, in a piece that you have done, John. This is uh, a, a cabinet. A cabinet. I see it as an entryway piece. Uh, oh. It was done on spec. Oh, it's wonderful. You've done that, again, Kumiko work up here on the door. And I see beneath uh, that, uh, this is cherry again? It's a uh, book-matched, um, resawn book-matched cherry, uh, quarter-sawn cherry panels. Wonderful. And, but, you know, in the Western tradition, this would be the most flamboyant piece you could do with flame coming out and everything and crazy stuff. Right. I try to keep my work um, very subtle. I'm looking for a sort of restrained, subtle elegance. Ah, the quiet, quiet. And, and the same is true on the finish, too. There's a wonderful, you can see the truth of the wood through this finish. Yeah, that's what a plain finish gives you. And this is also, this is all hand, all of the surfaces in my work are hand planed. Plane. All right, so we're going to achieve this truth in the wood. We've got to see how we get truth in the plane. Okay. So maybe we need to move to the technique. Let's start with looking at the element. First of all, let's look at, look at the technique once again and how you use the, the plane. Uh, the plane is pulled.